Coming up on Stu Does America, we explain Sweden's socialist utopia, or failing that, we at least get some delicious meatballs. Not the horse ones from Ikea, good ones. And businesses might be slowly uh, opening up again, but do you really want to play COVID-19 roulette in a movie theater at this point? We'll look into that. Be sure to subscribe to all of our excellent content we're creating for you, and it's absolutely free. Hit up YouTube, Facebook, or your podcast spots and get it all. Feel free to drop us a good rating and a nice review as well. It makes us feel special. And as always, the best way to enjoy the show is through a subscription to Blaze TV. You'll get me, you'll get other hosts that are actually good, great stuff, very low price. Head to blazetv.com slash stew and enter the promo code stew because that's how they know you like this stupid show and it gets you 30 bucks off. Nice. So are you all caught up on the latest season of Vikings? Good, because tonight we're gonna go a little Nordic on you. Sweden, one of those cute little cluster of Scandinavian countries tucked on top of Europe. They're probably best known for meatballs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are. Ikea, of course. Volvo. The Swedish bikini team. Another member of the Swedish bikini team, former, uh, that would be me. Mm-hmm. I know, I'm something like a quarter Swedish, so I can totally trash these guys tonight and get away with it. If you have any good anti-Swede jokes that you want me to tell on the air, just let me know. But the main thing they're known for these days is whatever the hell they're doing with COVID-19. The information is all over the place. One thing we know for sure is Sweden is definitely pursuing a, a strategy of herd immunity. As their chief epidemiologist, I'll never get that word right, said, in major parts of Sweden around Stockholm, we have reached a plateau of new cases and we're already seeing the effect of herd immunity. And in a few weeks time, we'll, even, uh, we'll see even more of the effects of that. And in the rest of the country, the situation is stable. And by the way, if you thought national health policy wasn't cool, then you don't know Sweden. Mm -hmm. Where else can you find the chief epidemiologist at the public health agency uh, appearing in tattoos? He's actually, they're making tattoos of this guy. It's fantastic. Although I will say we do have plenty of very strange Anthony Fauci worship going on here too. I don't, and it's a candle. I don't even understand it. Who would want a St. Anthony Fauci candle? Oh, everyone. Okay, that's great. All right. So anyway, we know Sweden is going to go for herd immunity. We do know that, except for the fact that they are most certainly not going to go for herd immunity. As the Swedish Minister for Health told CNN, there is no strategy to create herd immunity in response to COVID-19 in Sweden. Sweden shares the same goals as all other countries to save lives and protect public health. So basically, we have no idea what they're doing. No freaking idea. Honestly, I think most of the time in this sort of COVID-19 era, Sweden is just a stand in for the thing I want us to do, whatever that is. For example, one big part of the Swedish model is keeping the borders wide open. Not usually what conservatives mean when they say they want to adopt the Swedish model. Honestly, I wanted to kind of look into this uh, for a monologue because I wasn't really sure what the answer was. Is this working or not? There's so much conflicting information out there. I wanted to see what I could lock down. And this leads me to a point about this show. We've done just over 50 episodes so far, and look, things are going great. Whatever. The show continues to grow, and I can't thank you enough for spending an hour with me every night. Of course, we also have to get new people, and I'm told over and over again that some detailed, nuanced, graph-filled presentation about Sweden is not exactly what the masses want. Particularly if it's delivered by a lovingly overweight gentleman wearing the top half of a suit, and I suspect bottomless under the desk. And I get that. I understand. Makes a lot of sense. But I also don't want to do the same old crap that so many other shows do. I, you know, I feel like we're all adults and that you'd rather have some sort of knowledge and make your own judgments than have yet another show with surely a more attractive host regurgitating everything on Fox News or whatever. You're better than that. And the new people coming on board, I mean, they might not be, frankly. They might completely suck. Uh, so I don't know. We'll see. So if you want to get a little too nerdy, 
um, and I get that way occasionally here. When that happens, I'll try to throw in an explosion. See, look at that. People love explosions. I've, I've heard that. Or some really red meat to keep it lively. If you have any suggestions on how we can do that in the future, tweet it to me at Stu Does America. Okay, let's get into Sweden. The argument basically goes like this. Sweden hasn't, hasn't closed everything down like we have. They're doing fine. We shouldn't have closed down either. We blew up our economy for nothing. Let's just do what they're doing. So first, let's look at what they're actually doing. Unlike us, they have not closed down businesses and schools. They're trusting their citizens to make sensible decisions and laying off the big government edicts. That's not to say that they've kept the economy open. They still have a lot of restrictions that we would never have accepted as of like eight weeks ago. For example, we closed all schools pretty much uniformly, but Sweden didn't leave all of their schools open they closed both their high schools and universities, but, you know, left the schools open for younger kids. In Sweden, they also put a hard cap on gatherings like us. It was originally 500, then they lowered it to 70, and now it's lowered to 50. We can always talk about gatherings being banned, but actually, we still allow here in the States gatherings of up to 10. Ooh, in most, uh, most areas, depending on your state. I know they're all, they're all weird. Some states have gone further than that. But I remember that pretty much everything that we have on a national level is just a guideline. Sweden didn't close many of their outdoor recreation areas like ski resorts. However, most of them closed anyway on their own. Sweden didn't harshly discourage or ban non-essential travel like we have in some areas, but Swedish travel for Easter weekend, for example, fell by 96% to some of their vacation hotspots. We closed our movie theaters. Sweden did not. But the Swedish box office took a bit of a spill. In fact, it fell by 99.5%. I think that might have been noticeable on the box office receipts. So there were like four Swedes in a theater somewhere maybe saying, you know, I don't care how sick I get, there's a bad boy sequel in theaters and I need me some Martin Lawrence. I guess that probably happened. Speaking of that, we uh, have been a little too data focused here to start this monologue. Is there an explosion from bad boys or something that we can get to spice this up? <laughs> you know, it's count on Michael Bay. One of the uh, interesting coronavirus era discoveries is how many companies seem to have no problem publishing data on where we're driving. Sucks for privacy. Good for this monologue, however. In Stockholm, people were allowed to go out and about kind of at their leisure. But still, mobility dropped by 75%. In America, the numbers weren't all that different. In, in counties with stay-at-home orders, mobility dropped a little more than Sweden, about 83%. Still, in counties without any stay-at-home orders, mobility still dropped by 67%, only slightly less than in Sweden. The point is, just because Swedes are allowed to go out and do things doesn't mean they are actually doing them. They're standing a little closer to each other and they're wearing less masks and such. But when people believe they might just die by going outside, they tend to stay inside. It's also consistent with what happened in this country before the ban started. Restaurants and bars were already seeing sharp drop offs beforehand of over half in most cases. By the way, it's, it was a lot. I will say I am pretty sympathetic to the argument that voluntary is better than government enforced. And there have been some real examples of overreach. But some people seem to think that Sweden is living life as normal. That's just not true. As their foreign minister said, we don't have a radically different view. The government has made a series of decisions that affect the whole society. It's a myth that life goes on as normal in Sweden. Now, could we just copy and paste the Swedish solution into the U.S.? Well, probably not. The Swedes definitely have a different way of looking at things. They are much less suspicious of government and more trusting of experts. And I don't know if you've noticed this, there's just a tad of a rebellious spirit here in the U.S. that isn't as apparent in Sweden. And again, I can say this, I'm Swedish. We were always going to resist government advice a little bit more, and we're also not going to, you know, put up with them for much longer. Plus, Sweden is just a different situation. We know this as conservatives because we've been making this argument for decades against people like Bernie Sanders. We can't, just can't take the Swedish healthcare system and plop it in the U.S. It won't work for a million reasons. For pseudo quarantine, Sweden is built pretty well. It's so cold, people never want to go outside anyway. 
They have really good internet for annoying Zoom calls. They work from home in very high percentages, and most uh, uh, of their homes feature one person living alone. In Stockholm, about 60% of residences have only one person inside. You're interacting with far fewer people. Even in a dense area like Manhattan, it's only 25%, as you can see by yet another graph. Okay, we're losing the least nerdy people in the audience. The ones that had dates in high school. I see you out there. You're walking to the door, aren't you? Can we throw on something exciting? <laughs> the bus is blowing up for no reason. That was filmed in Sweden, by the way. Don't know if you knew that. So there are lots of similarities to what we've done and still a lot of differences in the situations and the people. But beyond that, has this actually worked in Sweden? A lot of people will throw around the fact that our death rate per million in the United States is lower than Sweden because it makes Sweden look bad. It's true, but I'm not honestly sure how valuable that information is. We're so much bigger with so many more people and more localized outbreaks. It just doesn't work. The same thing goes for people trying to compare Sweden to Italy and Spain to make the Swedes look good. Again, that doesn't work. They started trying to control the outbreak way too late and got hammered for it. It's more helpful to look at countries nearby that are so similar, honestly, they're basically just one country. I mean, not, most of the time we just say, yeah, you know, the Nordic countries, those guys. I left out Iceland and Greenland because they're islands. And, uh, you know, honestly, it's not apples to apples. Their rates of COVID, of COVID are very, very low. But here are the other Nordic countries on another graph. Denmark is about 75 deaths per million. Norway and Finland are about half of that at 36 per million. Sweden, on the other hand, has soared above them at 233 deaths per million, about three times Denmark and about six times Finland and Norway. And this is all adjusted for population. One really interesting thing here is that Denmark has a much more dense population than the other three. That's probably the reason they're higher than Finland and Norway, but they're still nowhere near Sweden. And again, I can say this because I'm Swedish. People will argue that these higher death numbers are okay because they're going for herd immunity, but they're not going for herd immunity. And we don't even know if herd immunity is possible. It hasn't yet happened with the common cold yet, and that's also a coronavirus. So the results of keeping people alive don't look that great in Sweden, but Look, we're all adults here. We don't want to lower the speed limit to four, even though that would keep people alive. So there are risks and trade-offs. While they may have more deaths, at least they're not blowing up their economy. Unfortunately, that isn't really clear either. We mentioned all the huge drop-offs in the various industries earlier, and that's the thing. Sweden is dealing with massive economic turmoil as well, despite keeping the economy open. One group of economists actually believe that Sweden's economy will contract more than ours. Their projections showed that Sweden's GDP would shrink by a half of a point more than the United States. The name of the group, the National Institute of Economic Research, which is part of the Ministry of Finance in the country of Sweden. Even the Swedes think they're going to do worse than us. So what does this mean? Get yourself pumped up, because I'm going to get in your face and light you up with a verdict of mixed. Yeah, mixed. Passionate position. I mean, the results are mixed. Do I like their approach of less government intrusion? Yeah, a lot. But has it worked in any meaningful way? I mean, not really. Most of the economy has shut down anyway, and the deaths keep piling up. The bigger issue is we couldn't have instituted a Swedish solution in the U.S. because we were way too late to do it. You can approach things this way when you don't have a massive outbreak in your largest city. We needed to stamp out those outbreaks before they got out of control. Now, we probably will go forward with something that looks a lot like Sweden. One thing that's pretty clear, we could have been a lot more like Sweden in a good majority of the country this whole time. Top-down policy just doesn't work that well in a large, spread out, diverse country like ours. Now, as we come out of this thing, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities to try something like Sweden in many parts of the country. We all want there to be an easy answer here, but you know, again, we're all adults. We know there aren't easy answers. We know usually things suck to a certain degree. We know that there are not really a lot of Swedish bikini models walking around Stockholm because it's 12 degrees below zero. 
We just need to be sober and deliberate about how we open this thing up, because I don't think the country is going to accept another six weeks like this for a long, long time. Maybe the Swedes would, but not us. For Mother's Day, you got to consider the Books company. Why? Well, Books is short for bouquets, so you know what you're getting there. Really good flowers. Responsibly sourced from some of the world's finest eco-friendly farms, flowers stay fresher for longer. And this Mother's Day is going to be a lot different than previous Mother's Days. Uh, if you're like me, your mom probably uh, is, lives in another state, uh, might not be able to visit them. Uh, it's not going to be the same. And so you really need to make sure you do not screw up the Mother's Day present this year. Flowers and plants have been proven to reduce stress and boost productivity, both good things in the middle of a quarantine. Send smiles no matter how far they are away with books.com slash stew. That's B-O-U-Q-S dot com slash stew. And enter the code stew for 25% off your entire order. Again, that's code stew for 25% off at books.com slash stew. Make sure you use the code stew because that's how they know you like this stupid show and you'll get 25% off at books.com slash stew. One of the many luxuries we haven't been able to enjoy during the pandemic is grabbing the family and heading to a good old fashioned movie. Now, that states and governors are making some small, careful moves to reopen the businesses. Um, it begs the question, like, what does that mean for the movie and theater industry uh, right now? It is it's a mess. Uh, it really is a tough place to be. Here to talk more about it is the editor in chief of Rebeller, Sonny Bunch. Welcome back to the program, Sonny. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Stu. Right. Um, you know, I uh, I looked to see. I, I know they said in Texas theaters could theoretically open at I think 25 percent capacity. However, there's a slight limitation in that no one's releasing any movies, so it's uh, not exactly the uh, experience you're used to. Um, can you give me a little uh, sense as to what the industry vibe is on how this all comes back? Sure. Uh, so you're right. The the Texas governor, Governor Abbott, he said movie theaters can open. I think as of this Friday. Uh, and, you know, that that's all well and good, except for the fact that no theater chains really want to be open right now. Uh, there, There's no reason to be open because there's nothing new in theaters. Uh, we can get to that in a sec. But the, you know, the, the Alamo Draft House, which is headquartered here in Texas, is the big kind of indie chain, you know, came out and said, we're definitely not reopening, you know, safety first, blah, 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 which is like a fine, bold stance to take whatever. But it, it, it really has more to do with the fact that there's no product. There's nothing to actually put in theaters. It's not like people are sitting at home thinking, I'm going to hold off on going to see Trolls World Tour so I can see it as it was meant to be seen on the big screen. You know, <laughs> it's a uh, it's 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 kind of a weird situation. So you could fill these theaters with a bunch of programmers, a bunch of, you know, uh, you could put in The Matrix, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, the 20th anniversary screening of Gladiator or something like that. But nobody is going to risk their life to go see a movie that's 20 years old uh, or 40 years old or 50 years old. It just doesn't make sense. So th for the for the short term, uh, I think, I mean, really, the, the next big release that's still on the calendar that hasn't been cleared yet is uh, Christopher Nolan's Tenet. That's, I think, the the kind of last hope, the last gasp of the summer. If if theaters are open, then maybe uh, that that will be the first movie that we see. And, I don't know. And what, what is the date on, on the Christopher Nolan film? Uh, it's the end of July. I think it's, okay. I want to say it's July 27th or wow. July 24th, something like that. But it's the end of July. Because that's not yeah, close. That, that's, yeah. that is basically it. No, 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 it's not. It's not close. I mean, look, the 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 the, the movie industry is in a very weird spot right now. Uh, the there there was a big fight uh, uh, between Universal and the exhibitors, um, the the movie theater companies, that played out this week in the pages of the Wall Street Journal and then the the Hollywood Trades. Uh, you know, the so Universal. Um, is the the first studio that really decided to break what they call the theatrical window. In theory, movies play for 90 days exclusively at theaters, then they go to VOD, then they go to Blu-ray slash DVD, then they go to the streamers. Um, so the, the theaters have fought very, very hard to maintain a 90-day exclusive window on theatrical releases. Uh, it, it, they, the theaters, the, the big companies, AMC, uh, Regal, Cinemark, Landmark, those, those types of places, they, they say, look, we can't exist if you don't give us that 
exclusive window. Mm -hmm. And Universal took the first kind of fired the first shot in this war by saying we're going to we're going to take The Hunt and Invisible Man and some of our other movies that had already been released and we're going to put them on VOD at a $20 price point uh, because the theaters are all shut down. Right. The, the hunt was out, I think, for 10 days before before everything shut down. Mm -hmm. They said, we spent all this money on advertising. We're not going to we're not just going to eat that. We need to we need to get some some revenue back from it. So then they fired the next big shot in this war uh, and they said, we're going to take Trolls World Tour, which was supposed to come out on uh, exclusively in theaters. And we are going to move it to premium VOD is what they're calling it, PVOD. Um, and it basically it basically was a, a, a move that said we are not going to necessarily wait for theaters to reopen. We'll push some of our stuff back. Universal has already pushed back uh, one of the Fast and Furious movies. Universal, uh, you know, Lord only knows when the next Jurassic World movie will come out. Mm -hmm. That that's also a Universal title. But they have they've made some moves to say, okay, we will accommodate theaters during this time of crisis. We're going to move some of our stuff back. But with Trolls World Tour, they they put it straight into theaters. And in theory, it's a good move, right? You have families who are basically locked at home with their kids. You have uh, you have a captive audience. You have no theaters open. They charged a, a pretty pretty high price point, but not an unreasonable one at $20 uh, to watch the movie uh, for 48 hours. You could watch it as many times in 48 hours as, as you could. It calls to mind the old days of Blockbuster, or family video or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and and, uh, you know, the the end result, uh, as was reported in The Wall Street Journal this week, was Universal treats it as a very good thing. They may they grossed about a hundred million dollars on PBOD, which translates to about eighty million dollars for the studio, which is roughly in line with how much they made from the initial domestic release of the first Trolls movie. Wow. Um, now, I am I am skeptical that this is actually a good move for Universal. Um, I, they certainly are treating it as such, but you know, this doesn't take into account foreign sales. This doesn't take into account any cannibalizing that they're going to be doing of their own, uh, VOD stream, which would have been a, which would have been another profit source. It doesn't take into account, you know, the, the, frankly, the, the money that they left on the table. I don't know. I, they they're they're treating it like a big deal, and I think, frankly, I think they're treating it like a big deal as a warning shot at the theaters to say, "Look, we're going to close this window. You can't do anything about it." And AMC said, "Not so fast. We are going to do something about it. We're not going to play any Universal movies anymore. We will not show any Universal movies in our theater as long as this nonsense continues." Um, and the other, some of the other chains have have uh, stepped up and said something similar, not quite the same. They've said. We're not going to play any Universal movies that don't respect the window. Um, okay. So that's not quite the the firm line in the sand that AMC uh, drew, but it is it is what what we are seeing is essentially a death struggle between the exhibitors and the distributors. Uh, and I, I I frankly I don't know who's going to win. Mm. Um, I, I it is it, it is such a such a weird time. Well, first of all, as a man who's already plopped down at about fifty dollars or sixty dollars on Trolls World Tour and seen it at least parts of it six times. Uh, I am very familiar with with this particular film and this experience. Um, you know, kids are at home. You're putting trolls on over and over and over again. They know all the songs. Um, I am. I, I'm interested to see because I remember the last time you were on here. It was, if I remember right, it was right before kind of everything went crazy, um, or maybe right as it was happening. <clears throat> and you had pointed out that you thought um, I can't remember which theater or chain it was, but they might not even be in existence after this. Regal, I think it was. Um, and we might not go back to the movie wow. situation the way that you know the the way that it was before. You still think that that can happen, or what's going on with these businesses? Uh, the the short version is this is why AMC is in such a tough spot, frankly, mm -hmm. because the you know AMC is teetering on the edge of bankruptcy already, as it is. Um, frankly, Regal is in not much better shape. It's in slightly better shape. It's, it's not in a great shape. Cinemark's in pretty good shape. But uh, you, you, we are in a situation where you have a bunch of theater chains that are essentially operating by just the absolute skin of their nose, you know, skin mm -hmm. of their teeth, hey, their fingernails are gripping onto the, the side there. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the issue for them is really one of life or death. Um, and that's why universal, uh, you know, universal feels like they have a pretty strong hand here that they can force the, the, the closing or at least the, the shortening of that theatrical window. Um, uh, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, let me switch gears a little bit. You, you're over at Rebeller, um, and it's a great site. It's I, I, one of the things I like about it is it's it. I don't know. It respects my desire for entertainment and not just like woke nonsense. Um, and you guys have kind of expanded here to a really interesting project. Can you tell the story of this book you guys acquired? This is I, I don't sure. know how I missed this, but this is an amazing story. Yeah, so about a year ago, a woman named Natasha Times, she was a debut, she, her debut novel was about to pop up on, on Amazon and everywhere else. Uh, and she was on the Metro in Washington, D.C., and she took a photo of a, a Metro employee who was eating on the train. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to D.C., but this is a big no-no. If you eat on the train, you get told to stop and mm -hmm. you can be arrested. There was literally a court case in front of uh, Justice John Roberts before he became <laughs> Supreme Court justice about a, a teenager who was arrested for eating a single French fry, right? Wow. Um, it was big, big headlines at the time. Anyway, so this, this Metro employee was eating on the train. Uh, she took a photo of the employee and put it on, on Twitter and said, you know, this shouldn't be allowed. Wamada, why is this happening? Um, and, uh, you know, for this act of snitching, which was wrong, I think we can all, she will admit now that this was, you know, not necessarily the best way to go about it. It was a, it was a, you know, she was trying to get somebody in trouble. Uh, <laughs> but for this, she got called a racist, which is a very, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty strong term to bandy about. Uh, so you have this Jordanian American immigrant who, you know, gets stopped by the TSA every time she goes and flies on an airplane and she's like, I'm getting called a racist. What's going on? I don't understand. Uh, and it spiraled out of control. It turned into one of these, you know, five minute hates on the uh, on the on the Internet. And she lost her she lost her book deal. The publisher pulled the book. Uh, she ended up having she went to the hospital. She was getting death threats. She had panic attacks. She had fled the country. She went back to Jordan for a couple of uh, weeks to be with her family and kind of unplug and get away from it all. And really, her life still hasn't been totally put back together. Um, and and uh, you know, the thing that my boss, Dallas Sanye, looked at with, with this was he saw the book. It's a good book. It's it's an entertaining book. It's, you know, got an interesting voice, a unique perspective on the world. Um, it's a novel. She she was a novelist. It's hard to get novels published. It's hard, even harder to get people to pay attention to them. Sure. Um, he looked at this novel and he said, you know, this is it's absurd that this work of art is getting thrown in the dustbin because people on Twitter falsely accuse this woman of being a racist. Um, it's it just it's a it's a total it's a total shame. It's a Travis mockery, <laughs> you could say. Uh, and he, he decided uh, he decided that that would be the first book that Rebeller published. Rebeller was always going to be a, a publishing label. We will have more uh, books in in the works, but he wanted this to be the debut novel to send a message to say, look, we're going to stand against the disingenuous outrage, the scolds, the angry mob, and we're gonna we're gonna publish this woman. We're gonna give her a second chance. Um, you know, I, again, like it, it, it's it's it it is it's not uh, the sort of thing that's gonna make anybody rich. But it was it made me it made me proud to work here. Frankly, Dallas was talking about this when I was thinking about taking the job, and I was like, somebody who stands up for art like that that that's a place I want to work. Yeah, you need strong people to stand behind art, especially when it gets controversial. And I will say, in my entire life, I have never had anyone else use the term Travis Shea mockery, a travesty, a sham, and a mockery all in one. I'm very proud of of having that happen on my program. Uh, Sonny Bunch from Rebeller Media. The book is entitled, let's see, it's uh, called They Called Me Wyatt. Uh, the author is Natasha Tynes. And when is it going to be available? Uh, it's out now. It's on. If you go to Amazon and you search for They Called Me Wyatt, you'll be right there. We'll get you, we'll get you up and uh, you can pick up a Kindle copy or a paperback copy. Awesome. They Sunny Called Me Wyatt by yeah. Natasha Tynes. There it is. Cool. Sonny Bunch, thanks so much for coming on the program. Appreciate it. Back in a second. Sometimes it's just fun to just talk politics. I mean, brute force, just blind politics. You're talking about people who are dying. No, I'm not. Not this time. This is just brute force politics for a second. P political strategy, if you will. One of the things we've seen, and I, I mentioned this in one of the early inter interviews, uh, talking about how a lot of people who are Trump supporters have taken a very skeptical sort of attitude towards the models and the data and people dying and all of these things. And it's understandable because there's been a back and forth. I think you know, conservatives are generally more skeptical on worst case scenarios. Just generally, I think a lot of that goes on. But just from a pure political standpoint only, isn't the best thing for Donald Trump's reelection? 
that you fully embrace the most apocalyptic model you can find. If you can find one that will say 100 million people were going to die from COVID-19, go to that one. Because the, the idea is, let's just say this ends at 100,000 people dying, which is terrible. And again, we're only talking brute force politics here. We have an exemption. Uh, if you're talking about that, at least if, if, if the, the number is, you know, 2 million people were going to die, you can say, look, Donald Trump took strong action, pissed off a lot of his own fans and saved what would have been 90 percent of the p potential death toll. Uh, on the other side here, uh, what are the Democrats going to say? Uh, well, we would have acted better and and, and stop 92 percent of that death toll. There's not really a good comeback to it. Uh, if that's a you know, they always say trust the science. The Democrats are always all over everybody's case about that, even though they don't seem to do it themselves. Well, let's trust the science, right? Like let, two million people. You said two million people. And instead it was 50,000 or 80,000 or 100,000, whatever it winds up being. That's a that's an action of that's a that's an argument of Donald Trump in the middle of the storm stands strong, takes tough action that even his own base doesn't like. And the end of the day, he steps up and he, and he eliminates 90, 95 percent of, of the, the terrible downside. Uh, what we're kind of seeing now seems to be more of an argument of, well, you know, you know, a bunch of people died. Um, and, you know, yeah, Donald Trump was president when it happened, but he was kind of like duped by Dr. Fauci or something. And it's like I. Isn't this isn't the whole point of Donald Trump to be this big, strong leader who doesn't take crap from anybody? I mean, I, I look, I you, you know where I stand. If you watch this show, I think this is, you know, the covid thing is really serious. And I think he's done, generally speaking, a pretty good job at walking this line. I don't like the light lo lo lockdowns. I like the fact that we're leaving the lockdowns. But I do think it was really important because we caught it so late to suppress it. Um, and I think it's been, generally speaking, the, the right line. There's always going to be some mistakes here and there. But generally, he's done a good job. So it's not, this is not my argument. But if you are a big Trump supporter and you're thinking to yourself, well, what's the best argument to make publicly? I think that one's much better. I mean, basically arguing that Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks duped your guy into, you know, letting a terrible thing happen and ruin the economy. It's not a good argument, is it? It's just for his political future. On the other side, the good thing here is that he has an opponent who can't um, stop screwing up all the time. We had two clips here. One uh, is about economic intercourse and one is about falling asleep. I, uh, I guess you have intercourse before you fall asleep. So let's go to the intercourse one first. I would, I would get much more engaged in the world. We can't step back. If, in fact, for example, we solve the problem in the United States of America and you don't solve it in other parts of the world, you know what's going to happen. We're going to have you're going to have travel bans. You're going to not be able to do have have economic intercourse around the world. There's a lot. Look, <laughs> when America goes alone, when, when America is first, it's America alone. And then what happens after you have a little economic intercourse? You By women in our country has been classified as essential. So this is an issue that affects all of us. Uh, young it looks like and he's old. Asleep. It really does. I. I I have not seen the end of that clip yet. Does he jar awake? Do we have you seen that? I got to see the end of that clip because you're not supposed to fall asleep during interviews, though every interview with Hillary Clinton is better while asleep. Imagine getting evicted for non-payment of a loan you never took out. It's called home title fraud. It's one of the fastest growing crimes in America. Uh, and there's really only one way to deal with it, home title lock. If you think about your life right now, you're at home, maybe, uh, you know, I, you've watched every Netflix show, you've, you've seen Tiger King three or four times, what are you going to do? Well, people who are hackers who do this for a living and want to steal your money, they, uh, they're going through the same thing. They've got time on their hands as well. And when they've got that time on their hands, they can come after your title, they can transfer it into their name, they can take ownership while you're still living in the house. You don't even know this is going on. They take ownership of the house, they, they forge your signature, um, then they are able to go to some shady bank and say, look, I bought this new house, isn't it beautiful? And they steal your equity. You get stuck with the payments, you're trying to chase it down, you don't want this to happen. Go to HomeTitleLock.com right now, HomeTitleLock.com. Use the codes too, because you know that's uh, gonna get you 30 free days of protection right now. 30 days of protection at HomeTitleLock.com. Code is Stu. Happy to welcome to the program, live from his quarantine chambers. Sure, did he abandon us here at the Blaze? Yeah, I mean, it's true. But he's over now at the CEO of Reach Digital. Jason Howerton is on the program. Jason, thanks for coming on. Thank you for giving me an excuse to shower 
and and have some sort of purpose in my life. <laughs> it only happens uh, every once in a while, I've noticed for myself. Um, but I, uh, I, I, it is a weird time. You're, you're wearing the shirt, Texas Forever. We're both in Texas. There is a, a little bit, I feel like, of pride about the fact that Texas is the one Uh, You know, I mean, Georgia was in there, too, but Texas was the first one to announce that we were going to kind of take these initial steps to open things up. And I'm kind of liking it. I'm I'm loving it personally, and I think it's more, you know, Georgia just, I felt a little open the floodgates. I like the way Greg Abbott is coming at this with a little more measure, um, a a little more, I mean, I I know he's gotten some criticism for the 25% capacity in restaurants and in, uh, you know, in, in other businesses that are opening up. But he's taking a very step-by-step approach, which I like, but we're moving the needle um, and we're kind of going to be guided by what happens in the data. So so I, I like the plan so far. I think that's a big part of this in that we, uh, I don't think the American people can take another trip back into what we've been going through here. I, I just don't think, I, we had, this is a one-time thing. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. We went in there. We, I think we suppressed this down to some sort of level, though the numbers today have popped back up for whatever reason. But the bottom line is we're, we got we to gotta be careful because we cannot let this thing get out of control and have to go through yet another period of this quarantine. I think that's the, is that the right uh, way to look at this? It is, um, and it, it, it's definitely in our hands of, of what happens next. But, but I do feel like everybody's at this level where it's like the, we're on I can, you can kind of just feel it it's bubbling up like people are done with this um i think there's a way to do this responsibly i think you know people wearing masks keeping their distance but still going on with their lives i don't think that's an unreasonable position anymore um i think the way the numbers look a lot of places have peaked i think we can get through this it's going to be hard people are going to die but what we can't have i feel like is this every two seconds you know the the media scaremongering looking at Mm -hmm. the you know every time somebody dies which is what's going to happen right we're going to open texas or we're going to georgia's going to open wherever's opening and then the headlines are all going to be uh after governor opens texas 10 more deaths this you know it's it's not helpful people are going to die unfortunately from this virus but there's also you've heard it a million times there's casualties from the economic destruction it's not as simple as just keep everything closed until you can't wait out this virus like it's gonna work it's gonna work its way through our society one way or another so the best we can do is come up with a plan that's responsible do our best to contain it um it, it, dr fauci says it's going to come back in the fall so it's it's here and it's not like we can just stay inside for long enough and then it's just we win <laughs> um we need to to figure out how to responsibly get back to society because otherwise even if we the virus is gone what do, what do we have left i mean look this was never meant to be an everlasting solution where we just kind of hang out at home until 2024 this is a situation where we we know we have to do this at some point. We should do it in a careful way. I think that makes sense. It's interesting though to watch the kind of culture around it. You know, you you uh, you, know, you were kind of a your big social media guru. You watch this stuff, and usually the stuff that that goes does really well on social media is like interesting insights, some you know funny points, some interesting observation. These things blow up. Yesterday, I just tweeted, "I'm going out to eat at a restaurant this weekend." Period, and. People are retweeting it and liking it, and and it's like, it's fascinating that this very basic thing that we all took for granted two months ago is now something that I, you get hate mail from other states. Like, I can't believe they're opening up your state and they won't open mine. It is a bizarre moment to kind of watch uh, as an observer. Do you know what's crazier is how politically divided people are about doing, like going out to a restaurant? Like, it's such a weird thing. Yeah. I was looking at this polling where it was like the vast majority, it was like Republicans said they were going to go out to eat, you know, within the month or something like that of the reopening. Mm-hmm. And like there was like 17 percent of Democrats or something said they were. It's like it's crazy how it's become like and I don't know what it is. I'm sure Trump and that psych- psychology has something to do with it. But it's so weird that we're now dividing lines of like when we get back to to, to normal life is now a Democrat Republican thing. It's like, I guess everything is that now. Yeah, that's apparently the only thing that we can do. Um, you, yeah, you watch a lot of, obviously, conservative media. One of the things, you, you point out that divide. And 
it, look, we're in a presidential election year. There's going to be some sort of divide. It probably shouldn't be about whether we go out to restaurants or not. Um, but I think there is this sort of position where the, the left is taking this idea that we have to be mega careful and you can't do anything. And you, if you want to open up the economy, you're just trying to kill old people. Um, and the other side of that, I think the correct other side of that is one you've sort of described here today, which is, look, we realize this is something serious. There's been a lot of pain and a lot of a, a lot of heartbreak for people and families have been affected. This has not been some silly little thing. It's been terrible. However, we have to be adults and kind of like look at this and make the best cost benefit analysis that we can take. I've seen a lot. There's another sort of group here that seems to want to just say this has always been overblown. And, you know, this isn't a uh, it hasn't been as serious. They've been popping this up in the media and scaring everyone. And there definitely has been have been elements of that. But I think that's not the right way for conservatives to go. I think acknowledging that this is the this is a serious thing, but we can still take steps to come back to civilization is a better path forward. What do you think about that? I mean, and I don't know how you can argue when 60,000 people die in, in three months that it's not something that's extremely serious. Um, so I think those people are just as silly as the people who who say that, you know, anybody who, who understands just from a just fifth grade level of economics, the repercussions and also the casualties of the economic destruction that this is g going to continue to wreak on our economy if we don't figure it out. Um, it's all—it's all silly. You, you, I mean, we're we're so without nuance, and you have one side, who, really, I think it's like very nasty, who are, are viewing this lens of how can I make this about Trump or how can I blame yeah. Trump for every death? You see the Vietnam War um, analogies, which are so stupid, like so dumb. <laughs> uh, and I said, I think I pointed out yesterday that 61,000 people died from the flu last year. And no, COVID is not like the flu, mm -hmm. but we didn't make that comparison last year because it's stupid. Like it's just a dumb thing to <laughs> totally say. Totally different things. But you have like the media and completely different things. And so, but you have the media, you have Democrats, like they, it's like they put out this memo that like, this is the new thing we have to compare it to the Vietnam War because that's, that's the same. It's not the same. So just, there's a lot of silliness going around and not a lot of, of people being adults. And again, bringing it back to Texas, I feel like Greg Abbott, I've been really happy as a Texan because I felt like he's more of an adult in the room taking this approach, which is, this is serious. We need to protect Texans. But guess what? We got to get back to work at some point. And so we're going to start now and, and then uh, see how it goes. Well, I have booked not one, but two restaurant reservations for this weekend. I'm very excited about it. Uh, I had to do it. Had to do it, Jason. So we're talking about it. We're talking about it. It's our... Um, you know, we're, we're thinking about if we want to leave the kids at home. It, you know, it's weird. Like when you have kids, it's like a completely different thing. If I didn't have kids, I'd be like out <laughs> on the town being responsible. But like I'd be going out this sure. weekend for sure. Um, there's like this little voice in the back of your head when you have kids, like you have that extra. But I don't know. I might join you. I, we, we haven't made a final determination here yet. All right. What's the best place for uh, people to find you? Uh, Twitter? What's, what's the best place? <laughs> Probably Twitter um, at J uh, at Jason underscore Howerton um, is my Twitter. Um, you can also check out the website uh, reachdigital.org. Uh, doing a lot of cool stuff with a lot of cool, uh, cool companies. Very cool. Jason Howerton, CEO of Reach Digital. Thanks for coming on the program. We're back in a second. People are making fun of Joe Biden for falling asleep uh, during an interview when we showed the clip earlier in the show. You know, I, I, I disagree. He's not just falling asleep. That's his superpower. That's what, that's what Robinette does, okay? Uh, Robinette is, of course, the transgendered uh, cousin of Batman, I think. Robinette, uh, the Joseph Biden campaign t-shirt. Get it at stewdoesmerch.com. See you tomorrow.